Okay. Hi, everybody. It's 5 o'clock. I hope you can hear me. I've just set the recorder to record, and I'm looking at the list of folks. We've got quite a few people on the line. That's good. Okay. Today, we're going to talk about establishing reliability for EPP-created assessments. This is very much like the webinar I gave yesterday, which was on validity, and we talked pretty exclusively about content validity, which is what um, CAPE is expecting. Today, we're not going to talk about all the different kinds of um, and ways to, the ways to establish reliability. What we are going to focus on is the kind of reliability that CAPE is expecting moving forward, as a, at least as a preliminary. I do want to state, as I did yesterday, that this webinar is for EPPs with visits in fall 2016 or beyond, and that's for those of you that are adopting the CAPE standards because they're required in, for visits in fall 2016 and beyond. Uh, for those of you that were early adopters or are early adopters who may be adopting the CAPE standards early, um, this webinar could be useful to you if you have not already submitted your self-study for your visit. And for those of you that have visits under the NCAPE standards or under the TIAC quality principles and your what we call legacy visits, this webinar will not be particularly useful for you at this time. Um, it could be useful for you as you start thinking about the future and addressing the CAPE standards at your next visit. Um, here we go. These are the webinar basics. I go over this every time, but I think everybody is pretty much familiar with this by now. Mute your phones. Um, that way we don't get background noise. However, remember to unmute if you want to talk, or I can unmute you on this end. Um, to ask a question during the presentation, use the chat or raise your hand. There should be a little hand icon next to you that you can click on, next to your name that you can click on to indicate that you have a question. There's also a Q&A where you can enter a question that appears in the chat room for me. Um, it's interesting because when I open the chat room, I see that you can address your questions to host or host and presenter or send to me privately. Um, if you do, please send it to me privately. If you send it to all attendees, I may not get it. And I don't get it till the end of the webinar and by then it's too late. So, there are feedback and question breaks um, throughout this presentation. If you would um, sent me a question in the chat room and I haven't raised it and attempted to answer it, please speak up and just ask the question in person. Okay. Um, the recording in this webinar is going to be posted on the CAPE website probably by Friday or soon thereafter. And if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, you can just email me. Here's my email address, develdridge at gmail.com, and I'll return to that first page, title page of the webinar, so that um, that, web address, that email address is visible. Okay. So what are we going to do today? We're going to focus on reliability. Um, this PowerPoint presentation usually lasts about 45 minutes. At least that's how long it took yesterday with validity. And this is fairly similar as we talk about reliability. So there'll be um, plenty of time at the end to ask additional questions. If you don't have any questions, you're welcome to log off, but I do stay on the line. Objectives, what do I want you to be able to do? I really want you to define the kind of reliability that CAPE is expecting. I hope you'll be able to identify the EPP-created assessments that require um, reliability to be established that you can explain how the CAPE questions about reliability can be addressed, and we'll be looking at those questions from two perspectives. One, if you were to submit assessments for early instrument adoption, or excuse me, early instrument evaluation by CAPE, and two, if you submit assessments for the self-study. Okay, and we'll take a peek at, those, at the questions that CAPE is going to expect an answer to. And then last of all, we're going to look at an EPP's statement about reliability, and I'll raise some questions that I hope you'll answer or chime in on about whether those meet research standards or you think they would meet CAPE expectations.
questions, and we'll look at the assessment rubric that CAPE will use to evaluate your assessments related to reliability. Okay, so moving along, what is reliability? Well, reliability has a lot to do with consistency or repeatability. Are you getting reliable answers um, or responses or ratings from the people that are doing the evaluating of your candidate's performance? So here's a quote from the Georgia Department of Education, 2013. Georgia Department of Education has some really good stuff about reliability that's online for, um, for their schools. And I certainly invite you to check it out because I found it very informative. I found it very user-friendly. And so here's what Georgia has to say on it. And this is not inconsistent with CAPE's expectation. It's a consistent definition of good teaching, okay? It is a shared understanding of that definition, and it's a set of skilled evaluators. And so in a few PowerPoint slides, we're going to look at some of what um, a training of evaluators would involve. And all three of these, or at least two of these, okay, a shared definition to understand what you're looking for. And um, is it a good, good quality definition of good teaching so that everybody can be on the same page? And we'll be looking at that in a minute. So evaluators must be able to consistently assess teachers accurately, okay? So they can accept those judgments, and they have confidence in the results. CAPE is interested, of course, in the consistency across raters and across time, because one of the things that um, has been true in my experience as a faculty member and as an MK coordinator back in the old days, and as a, as a dean is that we have a number of people out there evaluating our candidates um, using the same instrument. But I really didn't know for sure that a rating from one of our supervisors who was a, um, a university supervisor, one of their ratings meant the same thing as a cooperating teacher. And so that's why we're going to get into some integrated reliability, because the consistency of those ratings, you know, things don't have to be exactly parallel and exact all the time, but we do want people to be seeing things similarly so that we know when we get ratings on our candidates that it means basically the same thing. Okay. Um, CAPE's definition of reliability appears on 129 of the accreditation handbook. I double-checked that before I got online today and found that in another copy, or at least in another version that appeared on my, um, on my Adobe Reader, it came up as page 127. Okay, so just bear with me and know that the CAPE definition of reliability appears at the end of the accreditation handbook in the glossary under R for reliability. Um, just being a little silly here. So here's what we've got. Reliability according to CAPE, hello, come on, back up where I highlighted it. There we go. And let's see if I can enlarge this a little bit so you can see it. Someone pointed out yesterday in feedback that we needed these PowerPoints to be a little, print to be a little larger if you can actually read it. Okay, so reliability is the degree to which test scores for a group of test takers are consistent over repeated applications of a measurement procedure. Okay, you can read this definition yourself. So replace test takers with, you know, um, assessment raters. You know how to adapt this to your own purposes. In any case, it's highly reliable if you're getting similar answers on similar candidates and over time. Okay, so that the variable results, your candidates aren't running around looking for a particular supervisor or a particular cooperating teacher because word gets around, you know how our candidates talk to each other, and, you know, sort of shopping for the best rater. That's something we would hope would not be happening. Let me decrease this and get back into my, back into my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay. So there's the CAPE definition of reliability appearing on page 129 and thereabouts. So, CAPE's expectations about reliability are primarily centered on EPP assessment. When you upload assessments for your self-study, you are going to find that CAPE is going to ask for reliability questions. 
about those EPP created assessments. Now that means your observation instruments, your program rubrics if they're used by raters, any other tools you use to assess or evaluate your candidate's performance. And we'll look at a minute, I told you at the very end, on the reliability um, statement regarding a portfolio assessment. Okay. CAPE, um, recently I was with Stevie Chepko at a site visitor training and in Kentucky as she spoke to a group of deans and she did say that they're not going to require reliability on surveys, that that has to do with candidate perceptions and employer perceptions and completer perceptions and so reliability is not an expectation for any surveys that you have created. Okay. And I guess that would apply for dispositional um, tools as well. Um, Stevie did make that comment in relation to disposition tool that a, um, an institution was asking about. It was a survey of which candidates um, were rating themselves and faculty members were rating candidates in terms of how they perceived their dispositions to be progressing over time. Okay. Let's see what's next. So that's a pretty big statement there. Um, so what kind of reliability is CAPE looking at? And it's primarily this inter-rater or observer reliability. And it's the degree to which different raters or observers give consistent answers or estimates. Again, that example where, you know, we don't want our candidates to be shopping um, for ratings <laughs> across multiple raters, across university supervisors, across cooperating teachers and mentor teachers and whoever else we have engaged in the observation and supervision and evaluation of our candidates. What we want them to be focused on is about those skills and those dispositions and that knowledge that we're all looking for in relation to our teacher candidates. And so that focus um, can certainly be honed with a good, reliable, valid instrument. Okay, um, and here with good inter-rater reliability that, you know, across the Professor Deb Eldridge is not the, um, you know, the difficult judge in the trials here giving candidates low ratings as opposed to another um, observer who is rating candidates much higher on a rubric or an observation tool. So we'll get back to that in a minute about how to establish that. Because as you can see here, this again is from the Georgia Department of Education. It's the level of compliance that folks have with the scoring rubric. Are they kind of, you know, sticking to the rubric there and not sort of going outside the rubric to say, well, you know, that candidate really is a two here because, you know, he's not really doing this, but he's, oh, he's trying so hard. You know, whereas effort may not be a part of the rubric, and so ergo the candidate gets a level three on a, let's say, on a four point scale, um, by sort of inventing, um, categories or reasons for bumping a candidate up that may not be a part of the rubric. So it's the level of compliance with that scoring rubric. And it's degree of fairness or consistency exhibited when they're scoring an examinee's performance. So in this case, we say it's, um, a candidate's performance is a particular um, scorer or rater, evaluator, Deb Eldridge in this case, um, I have, let's say, five student teachers that I'm observing this semester. And, you know, there's one of them that I had, um, you know, some questions about. And so consequently, you know, the next time I go to rate this candidate, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm more vigilant, let's say, than I might be with with two of my other candidates who have been outstanding since day one and I and I just feel very strongly that they're well prepared to be beginning teachers. So that kind of individual variation in scoring needs to be taken into account. Okay, and then last, the understanding and the use of the rating scale categories. And so in this case, we want to talk, and we will in a few slides, about how scorers are trained on the materials that they're expected to use. Okay, so if Kate is just interested in inter-rater reliability, and yesterday, um, so what does that mean? What if you what if you have other forms of reliability? I mean, you've got a real statistical center at your university, and and you've got other forms of reliability or coefficients and statistical methods that you've employed. Um, Kate is certainly not going to reject that kind of information. That is 
wonderful, and you should be writing about that when the questions come up, and we'll deal with those questions in a moment. However, CAPE also understands that this is the very beginning of a set of his expectations about validity and reliability that have not been a part of accreditation in some instances in the past. I say in some instances because the TIAC um, model for accreditation has asked questions about validity and reliability over time. However, NCATE has not been specific in asking for that kind of information. And so therefore, CAPE has said, look, let's just go at the, at the beginning here, as we're all getting used to being more rigorous about the quality of our assessments. Let's focus on content validity. Let's focus on integrated reliability to get us all started. If you do more than that, CAPE is more than happy to hear about it and may actually in the future ask you to be um, an exemplar for others. Okay, so feedback and question pause. Anybody with a question or any feedback to me at this point? I'm going to open up my participant list and see if I have any hands raised and I don't see. Anybody with a raised hand at this point? Okay, if you see your screen gray out because I'm moving little boxes over. And here is a question in the um, in the um, chat room. What if your professional dispositions evaluation doesn't include a rubric? Based on Stephen saying that reliability doesn't need to be explained for surveys and professional dispositions based on perception. Okay, if your professional dispositions evaluation includes a rubric, um, you might want to submit that rubric to CAPE for some preliminary feedback. But if I'm understanding it, um, this is a survey. And if it's a survey and there's kind of some guidelines like a rubric to apply your judgment, there's only one person doing the evaluation of themselves, which would be the candidate in this case, if it's a self-report survey. And so, no, you don't have to establish reliability in that case. And if you have specific questions about this, well, what if in this particular case, um, before you submit your self-study, if you're not submitting it for early instrument evaluation, I would certainly reach out to Stevie or one of the other CAPE staff members and ask that specific questions. Um, right now, I would say no. It's a dispositional survey. It's based on perceptions. There's really only one rater, which is, you know, the candidate in this case. If it's a faculty rater <laughs> who's judging um, your candidate using the rubric, and there are a number of faculty raters who are using that same rubric, and evaluating that same candidate, then I do think that some integrated reliability is going to apply. Okay. How's that for a wishy-washy answer? A sort of what if, well, maybe, if this, then that. Sorry. Okay, any other questions? All right. Then what I'm going to do is go on to the next, to the next slide. So here's an important point. Um, CAPE has been asked a number of times, or CAPE staffers have been asked a number of times, what kind of reliability should be recorded. And CD has asked that I tell you that CAPE expects the percentage of agreement among raters. And so I took a paragraph here um, to say, okay, well, what does that mean? Okay, well, you're just going to say to what extent is there an agreement between raters? And it gives an example here. Let's say you have 100 observations being rated by two raters. Okay, if they check off the same boxes in 86 of those offer observations, then there's 86% um, agreement. And that's the kind of um, figure that CAPE would hope for. Okay, Not a statistical analysis of that, but rather what's the percentage of agreement amongst your raters? Okay, here are the considerations about training that I mentioned I would bring up. Um, one is the example that I gave you earlier. Our scares, our scores, ha, scares, that's a Freudian slip. That's probably how our candidates might feel. Our score is trained to recognize when a personal, societal, professional bias might interfere with their ability to fairly score response. 
And I gave the example of a candidate that I had questions about, and so maybe I'm a little more rigorous when I go in to observe them, a little more critical, a little more um, sort of poking at finding um, areas in which they're not um, meeting the rubric criteria, whereas with two candidates that I feel are doing, you know, very well, I allow that personal and somewhat professional bias to interfere so that it kind of predicts um, the scoring of that particular candidate um, the next time I come around, and that's something we really want to avoid. And so if you're talking about the kinds of inter-rated reliability you have and the kind of how you've established that, you might want to talk about a part of your training having been devoted to recognizing those personal biases that interfere. For those of you that have been ed PPA scores, you know that that is a part of their training program from Pearson. Okay, so here's the next, oops, let me go back, there we go. Our scores required to participate in a rigorous training program. And so here's where we get at that piece that the, the Georgia Department of Education pointed out. Do they understand what the definition of good scores, good teaching is? And is there a shared understanding of that? And so this is part of that, okay? Are they required to participate in a program that really gets into their understanding of what your standards, your rubrics, your items mean? Do they know what the criteria are? Are they familiar with that scoring guide? Can they be compliant with that scoring guide? Can you bring up instances um, such as I suggested where someone says, oh, but they're trying so hard, so I'm really going to move them into a three as opposed to a two, okay? And then last of all, do scores demonstrate mastery of the scoring process through multiple practice sessions? And so I'm going to put on my um, former faculty member um, and Kate coordinator hat and say that you know, sometimes what we've done in the past is to get everybody together who's doing the, the student teaching observations and sort of go over the the observation observation tool and go over the rubric and, and blah, 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 and then some, send everybody out um, to do their scoring, thinking that, you know, by talking through it, we've kind of established reliability. And what this is really saying is that, no, that really doesn't um, one-shot deals. I don't really um, make um, reliability a sure thing. And so what you will want to do is do multiple practice sessions. So, you know, establish those rules, as in the previous bullet, the familiarity with the tools, with the, with the items, et cetera, and then maybe show some videos and have people score as they're looking at those videos together and then talk about the kinds of differences and where things would fall on a rubric and why they would fall in a particular area and not fall in another area. Okay? So these are some things to consider. All right, I've had a couple more um, questions. It says, yes, multiple faculty members are using that rubric that we were discussing about professional disposition. So you're going to have a rubric that you're going to need to say to establish some of these kinds of things, these very things about um, do they recognize their personal professional bias? Are they involved in the training program? And can they demonstrate their mastery through multiple practice sessions? Again, I'm going to bring up the um, EdTPA example because I've been somewhat familiar with that. And I know that they start with sort of a, a group activity, then they go to individual um, activities in terms of scoring a particular um, entry into the EdTPA portfolio um, on particular assignments. And so that's good practice. That's good establishing reliability practice and something for you to consider. Okay. <sighs> Here we go. Possible ideas for training raters. And again, um, these are things that um, we need to think about across all our ratings, is that before those classroom assessments even begin, even if somebody's been doing this for for years, let's say four or more semesters using the same tool and the same rubric, those are the kinds of folks that you also want to include here, even though they're used to it. You know, sometimes familiarity, as they say, breeds contempt, although contempt is a very strong word to use here. Using a particular item makes you kind of less 
less attentive, let's say, to the rubric items themselves, feeling, oh, you know this rubric, and so, oh, yeah, that's a three, that's a two, that's a whatever. And so you do want to pull in folks for yearly retrainings, and that would be a very strong case for establishing reliability amongst your readers and for case terms. So as it says here, just some bullet items. Again, if you want to copy of this PowerPoint, just email me afterwards. I have it as a PDF. I can shoot it out this afternoon. Think about developing a common process for implementing assessment, okay? Observe and rate the same videos. I just mentioned that as a possible training tool. Use instructional rounds. This is a great um, tool to establish early inter-rater reliability on specific items. I think that's a great idea. Um, joint classroom observations and compare ratings after. Discuss any differences. Explain why you chose to give the candidate a two as opposed to a three and get another person's thinking on that. And practice writing feedback together as a group. Um, one of the things that um, Kate is very keen on is this idea of providing feedback to candidates. And so although there might be reliability in the ratings, we also want to be semi-consistent in the kinds of feedback that we're giving people. So those rubrics and the quality of those rubrics and those trainings allow us to be somewhat more consistent with the kind of feedback that we provide to our candidates over time so that the candidates know that this is in truth one of the very most important things that you're looking for and that no matter who observes them, if they aren't, you know, on track with that particular skill, they're going to be getting feedback to that effect. Okay. Um, this might be a question pause, and it is. Let me go back to the previous slide and leave that up and say, um, anybody have any comments, feedback, questions at this point in time? You can feel free to speak up. You can raise your hand. I'm going to pull the box over here right now to view all the attendees, and I do not see any hands up at this time. I do see everybody with their phones muted, which is great. Thank you. Um, and let's see, I don't see any other questions having come into my chat room. So if you posed a question on the Q&A on your screen, and I haven't answered it, there's a reason for that. It's not showing up on my side. Okay, I'm going to be I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Okay, I'm going to move on. All right, what are the reliability questions you have to answer? Earlier, I said that they'd appear in two places. One is that early instrument evaluation, and this is an an optional opportunity for you as an EPP to submit your assessments to CAPE and get preliminary feedback from them. It's a no harm, no foul part of the process. You submit those assessments, there are a set of assessment reviewers who will be looking at that and providing feedback to you. For example, we'll look in a minute at somebody's um, submission and their the words that they submitted for reliability. Your assessment reviewers are going to be looking at, at what kind of validity and reliability you've established. And these are the kinds of questions that are going to come up related to reliability. It's to describe how it was established for the assessment. And these are the questions that I think if you were to follow some of the guidelines that I talked about earlier, considerations for integrated reliability training and some possible processes that you could engage in, that these questions would be easy for you to answer. How do you know that multiple users are using the assessment in the same way? How do you know that each rater is using the assessment in the same way over time? And how have you determined iterative reliability or determined consistency across raters? These are all possible um, topics for you to include as you frame your answer to please describe how reliability consistency was established for the assessment. Now what I'm going to do here is log into AIMS using the CAPE password and the CAPE University login number. This is available to you to go in anytime you want 
and see what that looks like. Um, enter stuff into the assessment categories. You know, play around with this. It's called the sandbox um, in um, sort of web communities, I guess. I don't know, software applications. They talk about a, a, an opportunity for folks to go in and see how the system operates. So we're going to do that. I'm going to go into AIM, and I've got it called up right here. There we go. I'm going to put in that code, 24319, and I'm putting CAPE as the password, all small. Oops, and look, it's telling me my caps lock is on, so it's not going to work. Okay. What I'm going to do here is come to the home page, and this is what, this is what appears for you as an EPP. It's what will appear for you as you log in as the CAPE, um, into CAPE University. Under the accreditation process, click on Visit Reports. And when you do that, Self-Study Evidence and Self-Study Report will come up. We're going to talk about the early instrument evaluation here. And so to do that, you have to change the semester. You can see right up here in the left-hand corner, it says Fall 16, F16. I want you to click on that at the pull-down menu and grab a hold of Fall 14. And you'll see a whole different set of set of, a set of um, possibilities appear. You want to click on assessment instrument. Assessment instrument here means the early instrument evaluation. And what should appear for us is the is the exact tool that you would use to upload assessments. So here, remember these are EPP only created assessments. You upload your assessment and you respond to the context, okay, and it gives you the prompts. What I'm going to do is scroll down because there are three sets of boxes here. One, it asks for the context of those assessments. Where do you use it? How do you use it? When do you use it, etc. There's another set of boxes over the same assessments to describe the validity, and the last one is to describe your reliability. Here's the exact question that I had on my PowerPoint. Please describe how it was established for the assessment and consider these three questions as you form your response. Now, depending on how many assessments you upload, there is a limit of 10,000 characters. Remember, these are characters. They are not words, okay? So when you upload assessment number one, let's say this is your student teaching observation tool and you respond to the reliability question here, Remember, there's a limit of 10,000 characters across all the assessments you upload. So if you upload 10 assessments, just know you've got about 2,000 characters to respond to those questions right here. If you only upload two, you've got 5,000 characters you can fill in. So for example, if I write in blah, comma, blah, period, right down here at the bottom, this counter is telling me exactly how many characters I left for this entire chart, okay? What you can do here is to click in order to upload your file, okay? Save it or save and quit and move on to something else, all right? So again, those are your reliability questions and this is all part of that early instrument evaluation. Let me go on to the next possible opportunity to have a reliability question come your way. And that's at the point of the self-study report. So you're submitting your self-study, you're uploading your evidence, and the question that's going to come up for any EPP-created assessment you upload is how reliability and consistently consistency was established for the assessment. So you can go back, actually, since I've given you the key to the playground here, you can go back and see the kind of prompts that CAPE has um, put up for early instrument evaluation and consider using those prompts as you formulate your responses. We're going to go back in this time into the CAPE University again, except I'm going to pull down the spring 16 or fall 16 semester so that you can see the new template that's been uploaded for the self-study reports, how to upload your evidence, and where those questions are going to appear. Okay. So here we go, back into AIM. And remember we were here at fall 14, 
because we wanted to get to that assessment instrument. We're going to pull down fall 16. I need to correct my PowerPoint there. I think I put spring 16. You're going to pull up fall 16. And you're going to click on self-study evidence. This is where your assessments and things are uploaded. There you go. So take a peek here. I'm going to grab this box and put it way down off to the corner. Some people have already been in this tool and have uploaded evidence to just play around. Here's a disposition plan, for example. And notice that it's got a specific designation. It says it's state-specific evidence. Every time you see it, and you'll notice there's no little boxes underneath it if it's state-specific evidence or if it's data results. But if it's an EPP-wide assessment instrument, there are these little paper pages here. If you click on those, that's where those questions appear that you'll be asked to respond to for each piece of evidence that you submit. That's an EPP-created assessment, EPP-wide assessment. Look at the very final question down here at the bottom. I'll see if I can highlight it. And I can. It says, please describe how reliability consistency was established for this assessment. Okay? Now, in these boxes, there are 2,000 characters per box. So again, if I go in and do blah, blah, period, you'll see that the counter, again, counts down and you've got 1,989 left. Not two words. That's why you don't see 1998. It's characters. And so we have used, what, 11 there. Okay. Um, let me close this box down. There we are. Here's where we were under self-study evidence. I'm going to go back in there to show you what happened. If you go down here to the bottom and put add, that's how you can put a new file, a new piece of evidence, a new assessment into the system. You'll choose either file or folder, okay? If you want to establish a folder and put a few things in that folder, like you want the assessment tool itself, you want the rubric, you want the directions to students all in one folder, you can do that. Okay, we're going to go to next. Here's where you establish, do you want it to stand alone or do you want it to go into a particular folder? Okay, again, if you want that assessment, the rubric, and the student directions all in one folder, then you can designate a folder to do that. You get to say where you want, um, what line you want that to appear on. And here's the most important part um, for our purposes today. For every piece of evidence that you upload, you will have to choose what kind of evidence it is. Is it an EPP-wide assessment instrument? If so, those assessment questions are going to appear, and the question about reliability is going to appear for you to fill in. If you choose data results, as I pointed out, you can see behind this screen some data results showing no questions will appear. If you choose other measures, and I don't see anybody's done that, I don't think there are any questions to answer, and there are no questions related to state-specific evidence. So it's only for those EPP-wide assessment instruments that you'll have the opportunity to discuss reliability. And then next, of course, here's where you upload it. Okay? I'm going to cancel this, and I'm going to back right out and close this window and back right out of here, and I'm saying yes. Okay, so that's our, our demo using Cape University. Again, I've given you the password until I need to change this so it says fall 16, but you can see how to access that, and you're welcome to go back in anytime. Even upload things, you can always delete them at the end. There's that possibility. So go in and play around with that and make it your friend. All right, any feedback, any questions now? I'm going to check my attendees again. I don't see any hands raised. I'm going to check my chat room again. Oops. Come on, chat room. Come back. There you are. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat room either. All right, folks. You got me talking to myself again today. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so you put in your evidence. You've answered the question about reliability and validity. You've answered those five questions. Here's an example of a reliability claim for a portfolio assessment. Remember, the question was, please describe 
how reliability or validity, reliability or consistency was established. And here is a sample response. I'm going to read it out loud, um, so bear with me here. The faculty members assess the portfolios, and the portfolio coordinator reports scores to the quality assurance system for recording. Reading and evaluating the teacher residency portfolios is a regular responsibility of the College of Education faculty and is completed every semester. The portfolio coordinator provides detailed instructions, monitors portfolio results. The faculty read the same portfolio sections each semester, so there's consistency through familiarity with the standards and candidate progress. The results of the portfolio reviews are added to the quality assurance system after each round of applicants are completed. And due to consistent use and norming discussions during College of Education summits, we're able to assure the reliability and consistency of the portfolio assessment. So here's my, here's my question to you. Would the processes described by this EPP meet research standards for establishing reliability? And you can answer in the chat room, or if you'd like, just speak up. Okay. And we're just send it to me privately if you have an answer in the chat room. Would these processes meet research standards? Great. Somebody said the answer addresses consistency of using the assessment. However, there's no evidence of inter-rater reliability training, such as a course, a meeting, et cetera. Absolutely. You know, good answer. Absolutely right. What Cape is looking for here, because they say describe how reliability was established, they need to have a little bit more information here. Okay, about how, you know, what's the percentage of agreement? <laughs> and there's no discussion here of percentage of agreement, nor how that might have been established if it were to be reported. So, although there's some some good stuff in here, you know, it's a regular responsibility, it's completed, you know, there's detailed instructors, instructions, it doesn't tell us what are the steps, it doesn't tell us how portfolio results are monitored, okay, and although it, it hints, at there being College of Education summits or with norming discussions, it doesn't really detail what those were. Let's say were sample portfolios shared and did people rate them independently and then was there a, a norming discussion about how that portfolio, you know, who rated it how and what were the differences and how could we come together on the rating here? That sort of explores the use of the rubric that I assume is a part of this. So, very good point. Um, what recommendations would you give to this EPP? Let's take off your EPP hat and put on your assessment reviewer hat and say that you're, you're, you're one of the CAPE assessment reviewers. If this were the answer about reliability that was provided, what recommendations would you make? Because the assessment reviewers are not going in the early instrument evaluation, they're not really going to be judging this per se, more evaluating it in relation to the assessment rubric, which I'm going to share with you in a minute, and providing guidance for what to do in the future. If this is a part of your self-study report, and this was the answer given, then what the reviewers are going to do is comment on the quality of the reliability measures that were employed, okay? So, somebody, anybody, what's one recommendation you would make to the CPP? Okay, got an answer in the chat room. Thank you so much. Um, someone has said, establish some clear measures for training scores to demonstrate their understanding of the rubrics. Great, and provide evidence of the percentage of agreement, and provide evidence of training regarding freedom of bias would also be good. Super great. There's three recommendations right there that I think this EPP would benefit from. Anybody else? 
Let me scroll up here and see if another answer came in prior to that. Nope. Okay, thank you. To the respondents, I appreciate your willingness to engage with me here so that I can stop talking to myself. Okay, we're going to go here to the assessment rubric that Kate will use, both their assessment reviewers and their um, site visitor trainers. Um, site visitors, I should say, are going to look at instrument reliability right here. It's category 10. Let me pull up to the very first page here so you can see what I'm looking at. This is called the Rubrics for Evaluation of EPP Instruments Used as Accreditation Evidence. This tool is available on the CAPE website. If you go to the accreditation section and pull that down, you'll see a, you know, on the pull-down menu that there's another place called accreditation resources and that's where you'll find this rubric. So these give you not only an idea of how your reliability is going to be judged by reviewers or site visiting teams, it also gives you an idea on how to answer <laughs> some keys to answering these um, these issues. But it, besides getting into that early instrument evaluation set of questions and prompts that I shared with you earlier, you could also go to this assessment rubric. Most of us are going to want to be at least at a level three, which says there is there's at least a minimum here that we need to support that the self study is likely to meet the CAPE standards. Okay, so this is the sort of yep, it's, it's good enough for us to say that this EPP in terms of reliability is on track and gives us the kind of information we need to say it's likely they've met the standard. Number four says, okay, that it's really demonstrating the target criteria here. Then it's also likely to meet the CAPE standards and evidence guidelines at a high level of performance. So I suspect as a former dean that, you know, your deans are going to want to hope that you're somewhere in this area here, but at least you're going to be here and you're not going to be level two or level one. And so this gives you kind of a, an idea of the sorts of things to include in your response regarding reliability. It does say that a description or a plan, and this is where CAPE is providing you with some leeway. If you're producing this, if you're working on your self-study now and, you know, going through um, reliability, you know, inter-rater reliability scoring and multiple administrations and things like that, it's going to take way more time than your self-study um, allows. And then what you can submit to CAPE at this time is a plan. And what you would do if your visit is fall 2016 or later, is that you submit your plan and you submit on your progress towards that plan. So, for example, you could say we're planning to um, have a training meeting on agreements, um, on understanding of the rubric, et cetera, and we've scheduled that for, let's say, September 2016, and that will occur. We're also planning on um, doing instructional rounds in the fall semester, and we're planning on co-scoring from a video in December at a faculty retreat. So these are the kinds of things that would be helpful to include in your plan. And you can refer to this rubric to formulate your responses. Okay, so let's go back now. PowerPoint. Are there any final questions, final feedback? Don't see any new questions in the chat room yet. And let me check my participants and see if I see any hands raised, and I don't. Don't see any hands raised. Okay, so it's, we've got about 10 minutes left. These webinars are scheduled for one hour. So what I'm going to do is say that's the end of the webinar and show you the final slide. And I'll be hanging out here for the next 10 minutes or so to see if any questions come up once we've finished. Um, I will be sending you a feedback survey in the next couple of days to provide feedback on the webinar and make suggestions for improvement. Um, I'm also giving you a heads up about what the webinars are 
planned for September, October, and November. And what we'll be doing in those webinars is focusing on each of the standards in turn. So you can see standard one and two in September, three and four in October, and standard five at the beginning of November. That will be followed by a discussion of the cross-cutting theme. And then I think our final webinar for the year is on aligning and tagging evidence. So now I'm going to hush. And if anybody has any questions, please ask. And for those of you that um, got what you needed from this webinar, you're free to log off because there's nothing further I have to contribute. Okay, we've still got some folks in there. I don't see any hands up, though. And hearing ding, ding, dings, which means folks are, are leaving us. I did have someone say thank you, and I appreciate those personal messages that tell me I'm not a complete waste of time and that this has been somewhat helpful to you. Thank you for that. Nope, still no hands up. Just a few people left. If you want to just speak up, feel free. I'm going to take you off mute. Anybody? No, only one person left, Gail, that's in teleconference. So unless you have a question here, I'm going to, I'm going to um, end our webinar today and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Oh, okay. Thank you, everybody. That's it for today.